So, Chris, uh, uh, for, for the reading for this session, uh, the first five sections, um, it's impossible to, I think, begin reading this poem and get five sections into it without beginning to think, all right, what's, what's he up to here? What are these section divisions? What structure is there to the poem? And he, he really challenges us right in section two when he says, have you practiced so long to learn to read? Have you felt so proud to get at the meaning of poems? Stop this day and night with me and you shall possess the origin of all poems. You shall possess the good of the earth and sun. There are millions of suns left. You shall no longer take things at second or third hand, nor look through the eyes of the dead, nor feed on the specters in books. You shall not look through my eyes either, nor take things from me. You shall listen to all sides and filter them from yourself. And the interesting thing there is that evocation of stopping this day and night with me. He gives you a sense of just how long the poem is going to be mm -hmm. as he starts it out here. It's a, it's, a, it's a journey. You're stopping with him. And you're reading, he emphasizes a poem. And he mocks the idea that this is a poem that you should read with the idea of getting meaning out of it, yeah. of being so proud that you can say, I know what this poem means. So all the questions of structure are raised right here, right up front by Whitman. He's going to teach us through structure how to read his poem, even as he warns us not to read too much into it because we will never get to the very depths of meaning of, about this poem that is untranslatable. Right. And I remember a conversation last summer where we began talking about some of the ways that the I and the you construct this poem. So there's this dramatic moment in the notebooks where Whitman announces, I am the poet of slaves and of the masters of slaves. I am the poet of the body and I am. He breaks off and as we start thinking about the, the origins and then the structure of the poem, it's as if he's looking into the future or into an abyss or at a mountaintop. What happens at that point? Yeah, that, that really is one of the great mysteries. I, I, I love the way he breaks in the notebook at that moment because anything can follow that verb. Right? I am the poet of slaves and the poet of masters of slaves. I am the poet of the body and I am the poet of the soul. One thing I think that happens here is that what what we still don't have at that originary moment in the notebook is the other main character of the poem. We the, talked about this the last time. Right, the you, right? That, that ultimately the, the, the huge democratic claim that Whitman is going to make, the really outrageous claim, is I am you. Yeah. And, but to get to that, to get to that last word of Song of Myself, from the first word I to the last word you, he's going to have to travel a long road. And that road is the poem, right? Can he convince you, the reader, that you and the I share the same experience, the same thoughts, the same broken down hierarchy that that levels experience out in a democratic way, can he pull that off? Right? So when he stops in the notebook at that originary moment, and I am, right, there's a way that that's both a concluding statement and an opening statement. Mm -hmm. You can hear it, and I am. Right. Actually, what I also hear right now is Rambeau writing just a few years later saying, and I am is another. Yeah. It, yeah. It, it's as if yeah. they're making a similar leap into the unknown. Yeah. 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 Exactly. And and so this this you that is invisible at this moment in the in the uh, 
notebooks becomes very visible when he finally begins to put the poem together, appearing twice in that first paragraph and then moving throughout that the, the, the poem uh, so that the, the main characters of, of the poem become those two pronouns. This is part of what makes translating Song of Myself such an impossibility, right? Because Whitman lives for the promiscuous I and the promiscuous you, right? That I that can shapeshift into into anything in that the democratic culture puts up. And the you that can be a word indicating his most intimate lover or a perfect stranger or a world of strangers. In English it's all the same word and it's the only language that has that really promiscuous pronoun. So that as we're reading Song of Myself we can hear that you speaking to us very very personally and intimately and we can hear it speaking to the whole world simultaneously. Translators have to make a decision. Ed, in our first conversation about the structure of Song of Myself, we looked at the metaphysical structure, the relationship between the I and the you. And in a subsequent conversation, we took a more physical view of how the poem is structured. Uh, the very way it's laid out on the page. Yeah, the Whitman's, Whitman always fascinated with the material embodiment of this poem. And uh, that was the topic of our next conversation. When Whitman uh, uh, first published uh, Leaves of Grass in the 1855 Leaves, a big book, um, and uh, uh, when we, you open it you can see Whitman's lines uh, extending across those big pages. Um, Whitman never planned the book to be this big. It was printed by a friend of his, uh, Andrew Rome, who ran a legal print shop. Mm -hmm. And this happened to be the size of the legal forms yeah. uh, that were printed in that print shop. And uh, that's what the press was set up to do. So Whitman had to really improvise and adapt as he was uh, he actually set a few pages in type himself uh, since he was a typesetter. And um, uh, this looks like a page that was made for those long lines, but in fact Whitman would never again after the 1855 go back to the big page. He, the 1856 was a very small book, mm -hmm. a devotional sized book, and um, and then the 1860 was uh, uh, this size book where Whitman's lines were broken and he didn't seem to mind that. He liked the idea of breaking the lines rather than stretching them across the page. Yeah. So it's, it's interesting when we think of how Whitman is imagining constructing the, the, the poems. A lot of our uh, first suspicions prove not to, to hold up. And one thing I hope people will do as, as they read uh, Song of Myself in the 1881 version, the, the final version that uh, uh, Whitman revised, um, read it there in its 52 sections, but then go back, go to the Whitman archive and take a look at the 1855 version of the poem where there are absolutely no breaks. Yeah. Right. We're, we, we're doing one section a week for 52 weeks on the Whitman web, uh, 52 sections up there, but in the original 1855 version, which was simply called Leaves of Grass, the poem has no breaks and instead of standard punctuation, he uses dots, mm -hmm. a kind of ellipsis to separate the thoughts so that everything flows in a way that later it would be divided up. And we have no idea why Whitman made these decisions. By 1860 he, he was numbering all of the verses in Song of Myself so that it looks almost biblical as you read it, as if you're reading verse 84 of Song of Myself. Um, we have no idea why he was doing this except that he was continually trying out 
new forms, new ways of thinking about that poem, new ways of dividing that poem up. And um, uh, I think that uh, uh, there's no substitute for reading this poem in its various versions and beginning to think why at this particular point in America's history, in Whitman's own life, do the forms begin to change. It's almost as if he recapitulates the history of the universe, that first version of the poem seeming like in the undifferentiated mass at the origin, right? And then we, we have the biblical numbering sections, and finally we end up with what looks like an almanac. Every week you have the 52 weeks of the year. Any idea how that, that last thing came into being? What, what prompted that? No, it's um, one, one of the, the enduring mysteries of reading Whitman is to see all of these clearly very careful and conscious changes with virtually no commentary. This is, this is where you, you, you kind of wish that the, the genre of uh, interviews with poets uh, was, was operating in Whitman's time. In fact, he was interviewed by a number of people, but they would never ask him these structural questions. We have uh, at the end of Whitman's life, uh, his, his, his final few years, day by day records of conversations with him by Horace Traubel. Uh, nine volumes, 6,000 pages of conversation. Very, very little conversation about particulars of his poetic decision making. And he offers no clues in the many uh, uh, glorious reviews he wrote about his own book. He was a wonderful uh, self-promoter, if you will. But it leads to that larger question. He starts out as a newspaper man, and surely that influences the structuring of the poem. Yeah, it, 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 I, I, I think his training as a typesetter, his experience as a newspaper reporter and editor, all of those things feed into his creation of Leaves of Grass, the book, and into Song of Myself. 19th century newspapers, um, you can go online and look at the newspaper he edited for several years, the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, and see the actual copies that he edited. The papers uh, are, are an amazing collage themselves, uh, from, from top news to a little funny joke in and the corner. Set, set side by side. Even. Set side by side with a poem, mm -hmm. uh, oftentimes right at the, uh, yeah. the top of the front page of the paper. Uh, a continual uh, playing with uh, uh, juxtaposition, with, with being able to uh, read on a single page the variety, diversity, of all the experience of the day, mm -hmm. um, all in one place, and you you certainly capture that 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 sense that that feeling that Whitman creates in Song of Myself, of of radically different experience occupying the same space on a printed page, and and Whitman's printmaking capabilities, his typesetting capabilities. Um, play everywhere in his construction of Leaves of Grass. He was a bookmaker as much as he was a writer of books, and uh, he was very, very concerned about what these things looked like and felt like in your hand, mm -hmm. very conscious uh, of the physical interaction of the book and the reader. Uh, we're doing this course online, and we're offering people the experience of reading Whitman online, uh, and I'm not so sure how Whitman would have uh, reacted to that, since for him there was a, a, a magic in that palpable feel of the fingers on the paper. Yeah. The, his later uh, arguer, Ezra Pound, would say that poetry is news that stays news. From the start, Whitman seems determined to to make that news stay news in a physical form, how could he have imagined the fact that at some point there would be a, a digital version of Whitman, except that on some level he must have known this was coming, right? Right. 